everybody. I'm Erica Muller, and this is Vacation Rentals Are the Future. Welcome back and a very happy new year to all of you um, going into 2023. I'm really excited to learn today more about where vacation rentals are heading in the next year. And to talk about that today, we have Joshua Montgomery with us. He's with the Ohana Ina Association Advocates. Um, for short-term rentals. And we're gonna discuss today about the uh, regulatory landscape and the benefits that vacation rentals bring to the community. So welcome to the show, Joshua. How are you doing today? Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm doing great. It's always a beautiful day in Hawaii. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do um, at the Ohana Aina Association Advocates and how you're helping the vacation rental community uh, make progress over there? Sure. So I took over as the president of Ohana Aina about a month ago, and the organization's goal is to promote a, a few basic principles. Um, one of them is private property. So the idea that, that folks should be able to do with their property uh, what they choose. Uh, one is the vacation rental as, a, as an industry. So, you know, advocating to make sure that locals here in Hawaii can participate in, in Hawaii's largest industry, which is tourism. Uh, and then also uh, to promote the, the participation in that industry as capital owners. So, you know, here in Hawaii, our, our major industry as a community is tourism and and a lot of folks work in that industry as wage earners. Our goal is to make sure that, that more people can participate in that industry as capital owners. So people who own things that make money as a people, as opposed to people who, uh, you know, go out and work for an hourly or an annual wage. Oh, that's beautiful. I love it. And I love to talk to people like you that are actually pushing that for the local homeowners, because I'm a big advocate myself on being able to use your own property as you want to use your own property. Um, and when you close that down, when you close that door on people, it's just, it creates so many ripple effects in the community. Um, vacation rentals supply a lot of jobs as well. And I'm sure you know about that um, in the community. Do you know, do you have any statistics or numbers just about as to how many jobs the vacation rental community is actually supplying locally there? Or do you have an idea around that? Vacation rentals here on the Big Island of Hawaii affect 7,500 families. So that's wow. right around 20,000 folks in our local community or around 10% of the island is involved in the vacation rental industry, either as property owners, managers, or as service providers, folks who provide uh, maintenance or cleaning services for vacation rentals. So it's a pretty sizable uh, chunk of our, our broader economy, and it's one of the few places that locals in Hawaii can participate in the tourism trade, you know, as, as owners of property as opposed to as, as wage earners. And, um, you know, so much of the vacation industry here in Hawaii is international conglomerates. You know, people fly here on international uh, airlines where the money goes back to uh, airline companies on the mainland. Uh, they stay in hotels that are owned by, you know, Wall Street um, hedge funds. You know, when they're here, they rent rental cars from publicly traded rental car agencies. And so even though they come to Hawaii and consume our resources, um, when they're here, the money that they spend doesn't necessarily stay in our community. And so in the vacation rental industry, you know, that, that money goes to homeowners um, and it goes to service providers who you know, are negotiating with homeowners for wages on a much better level playing field. So they make higher wages and have better working conditions than they would at a big hotel. Oh, that's that's really great information. And that's kind of what I was looking for. And so what do you think the effects of what happened last October when we had this sweeping regulatory um, mandate go across, I think it was in Honolulu and the surrounding area, um, what do you think the effects of that were on this local economy that you're talking about that is made up of the home sharing economy? Yeah, so the, it's important to look at the vacation rental industry holistically. So as a broader industry, not simply as you know absentee owners or as folks who run hosted rentals or as homestays, um, but simply as as people who participate in the tourism trade by providing rooms in in small establishments. So I would I would argue that bed and breakfasts probably fall in our in our category as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, the regulatory changes that are being pushed through, you know, in large part are being supported by the HTA, the Hawaii Tourism Authority, 
um, which has historically acted as a mouthpiece for the big hotels. So think of these big hotels that are owned by hedge funds and, and Wall Street firms. Um, that's their voice in the market. And, you know, the the regulations are being driven by local hotel managers and local um, hotel operators. And 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 I kind of want to unpack who that is. Um, you know, the the tourism industry is such a huge percentage of our, our economy, and it's so important. And yet the HTA is being managed and driven by people who are middle managers and hotel conglomerates. You know, many of these folks, they wouldn't be able to get the CEO of their company on the phone if they tried. And yet we're turning over the economic development of our communities to these people. They may have a, a two-year degree in hospitality management. They're not PhDs in, in economics. And you know, they're advocating for a world that's a zero sum game, right? Mm -hmm. So they look at the industry and they say, you know, a hotel room or a family that stays in a hosted vacation rental is a family that didn't stay at my four star, four seasons hotel on the coast, not really realizing that there are two very different markets, that the family that flies to Honolulu on Southwest Airlines, you know, spends maybe a thousand dollars on airline tickets you know, they really need a hosted rental that has multiple rooms and a kitchen because they can't afford that champagne and fine dining experience that the Four Seasons is providing. And so they're looking to stay in, uh, in a, the types of accommodations that our industry provides, and they actually grow the market. So, you know, these, these hosted rentals or these vacation rentals actually increase the size of the tourism trade and make it available to more middle-class families. The regulatory regulations that they're putting in place to limit that are really detrimental to the broader economy because what they're effectively doing is reducing the amount of money that's flowing into Hawaii. And since this is the biggest industry in Hawaii, you know, that's effectively putting constraints on the broader economy. And so not only does it affect the, the individual families who are being regulated out of this market, but it affects the broader economy in a, in a really negative way. Um, and it concentrates even further um, wealth in the hands of these corporations and these these corporate hotels. Yeah, well, like they say, follow the money and then you always find the answers. So uh, thank you for sharing all that. And, you know, it kind of breaks my heart what's happening. How can we, what are you guys doing right now to kind of balance that out and prevent more of that power um, of taking over and pushing more people out of the home sharing economy? Sure, so here on the big island, you know, a, a couple of members of the county council, you know, have proposed some legislation that would put severe constraints, not on vacation rentals in general, but on hosted rentals. So on people who host a, a family in their home or in an ohana on their property. And since 95% of the Big Island is agriculture, um, you know, it's very much affecting uh, farmers. So farm stays. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing is working really hard to tell our stories. You know, here on the Big Island, you know, the only way that many families can make ends meet is by renting a room or renting an ohana or renting part of their home as a homestay. You know, if they don't do that, you know, they don't have the same type of economic opportunities that you have in some of these other high cost markets. So, for example, if you were in San Francisco, you might have access to a job that pays a quarter of a million dollars a year at Google or Facebook or, or YouTube or Amazon or Tesla. You know, if you're in New York, you might have access to that type of employment with Gold, Goldman Sachs or Citigroup or one of the other big investment firms. Here on the Big Island of Hawaii, we don't have any of that industry. And so even though we have real estate prices and costs of living that are similar to what you pay in Manhattan or in San Francisco, you know, we don't have that, that type of income. And what, what that's really driven is a wedge between the haves and the have-nots. And one of the ways to continue to maintain that middle class, you know, the people who can afford to live here and own a home is for people to rent their homestays. So one of the things we're doing is telling that story, is having families that depend on this income get up and say, hey, you know, this legislation effectively forces me to sell my home. And then one of the other things that we're doing is we're debunking the, the myth that homestays create a, an affordable housing crisis. We have an affordable housing crisis in Hawaii because they're not building enough homes. The permitting department and the regulatory environment are such that it's next to impossible to build a new housing development on our islands. And as a result, housing construction is not keeping up with housing demand. That is not the fault of somebody who is renting a converted garage to tourists who come and visit the island. 
That is the fault of the very regulators that are proposing this rate, this type of regulation. And so, you know, when we look at the broader housing market, we're starting to look and say, how can hosted rentals improve the market? And we're starting to tell that story as well. And I'd be happy to, to share a little bit more about that with you. Yeah, I'd actually love to hear it. And then too, um, before you get into that, you had brought up the topic of agritourism, which you said is really um, kind of how a lot of people are making ends meet on the big island. I'd love to hear more about that as well when you're done, but please go ahead and continue that story because it's very interesting. Sure. So, you know, here in the big island of Hawaii, one out of every five houses is sitting empty every year. So, I mean, just, just think about that. Like you walk down the street and every fifth house doesn't have anybody in. And, and a lot of that is because those houses are being used as second homes or as vacation homes from people who are in some of those, those higher end markets. So San Francisco and Los Angeles and Seattle. And so the question for how to return affordable housing to local ownership isn't so much a question of whether we have enough housing, it's a question of how that housing is distributed. And you know, there's two ways to make put those houses into the hands of locals. One is to reduce the cost, right? Is to get the prices down. And I, I don't think that anybody is advocating for all of us to lose our home value. Um, and so that 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 approach doesn't seem to be something that would be palatable to the broader community. Um, the other way to do it is to increase the income of locals so that they can afford these homes. And one of the ways to do that is to take those homes and turn them into hosted vacation homes. So, you know, larger homes that might cost two million or three million dollars, where a family lives in the home and rents a part of it as a vacation home. And the economics of that make it make sense. You know, you can't take that home and divide it into two long-term rentals because they they actually, they don't cover the, the cost of the mortgage. But if one of them is a hosted vacation rental, it does generate enough income for that family that they can afford that two or that $3 million home. And so we're working to create a fund that we're calling the Ohana Aina Fund that helps locals that have good credit and might participate in the tourism industry as maybe a, a, you know, in a cleaning capacity or in a maintenance capacity or in a management capacity to actually purchase their own home and convert that home into a, a portion of it as a homestay, the rest of it to house their family. And what we do by doing that is we take vacation homes that are high end that a family might not otherwise be able to afford and we create a revenue stream that allows a local family to purchase that property and both live there and use it as their source of income. But of course, we can't do that if the state government and the local governments regulate these folks out of business. And so we look at, at the homestay industry as a way to create wealth in our communities and to make sure that local families can participate in the tourism industry as owners instead of as wage earners. And that's that's a big part of what we're what we're promoting here on the Big Island and a big part of our story for using hosted rental income to improve access to housing. And and in that case we call the housing obtainable housing, not affordable housing. The idea is to put it within the grasp of a local family, not necessarily to make it cheap. No, I love that. I think that's going to benefit not only the community as a whole, because you're keeping property values up, but you're also helping people find homes and stay in them. And that's huge. How, how are you doing that? I mean, who owns the house? Is it the local family that's buying it that owns it? Or is it like a co-ownership with you guys? What does the structure of that look like? So we're not 100% certain. We're just launching this initiative, you know, here in the, the first half of, of 2023. Um, I, the method that we're looking at doing is purchasing the homes through the fund and doing the remodel um, with a professional contractor and all the appropriate permits and stuff under the assumption that a lot of folks who might want to participate in this type of an effort might not have the skills to manage a big construction project and all of the permitting and all of the architecture and, and all of the other pieces that it takes to divide that home into in, in, to increase the density, right? Right. Um, but once that's done, the idea is to to create a a work to own situation for the homeowners that's not exploited, right? So, you, the goal is that after a couple of years, they've demonstrated that income to the point that they can get a traditional mortgage and purchase the home outright as their own home. Really, the 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 place where there's a need in the industry is the place from purchasing the home to getting the revenue stood up 
so that you know it's provable. The, the reason that many families couldn't do that today is in order to buy a $2 million home, they would have to demonstrate hundreds of thousands of dollars in income in the prior two years, or the bank wouldn't lend them the money, right? Yeah. And so the Ohio Ina Association would effectively act as a bridge between the original purchase and when the businesses stood up to the point that they can get a traditional how traditional mortgage and proceed, you know, the same way that that other high income families would. Interesting. And so what's your underwriting process going to be like on that? Because I know for us, you know, at my company, I don't know if you know what we do. We do data for short term rentals. And so we have data on every property in the country and the cap rates and all that stuff. And what I've noticed is, especially in markets like where you're at, the the property prices have appreciated so much over the last two years and the revenue that you can make off of the the rental income, even as a short-term rental, hasn't quite caught up with those purchase prices. So whereas, you know, two years ago where something would have been a 10 cap, you know, it was returning a 10% return. um, Now it might be at like a four or a five and it would barely be able to cover the mortgage, right? And so what we're, oh, go ahead. The, the idea isn't to do it as a, as a, the way that you would as an absentee owner. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea is that these are hosted homestays are not necessarily the primary employment for the family. And so, you know, the uh, family, uh, the family would be involved day to day in operation of the homestay, but you know, that if you're operating a single vacation rental that does, you know, as somebody who operates several, yeah, that does leave you with a lot of time to do other things. And so It's not intended as a replacement for employment, but it's intended as a mechanism so that people can obtain housing. Yeah. So basically it's going to offset the expense of that mortgage, whereas maybe their current employment might not cover all of it, plus be able to give them enough money left to live with inflation and everything. So that's just the additional rev stream that you guys are helping create for them. So it becomes affordable for them to own it, right? Exactly. It, it, It creates, it makes the housing obtainable. Whereas today, you know, if you're if you were, let's say, a maintenance person at, on a STBR for a bunch of STBRs, or maybe acting as the host or acting as a manager, you know, maybe you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year each. You know, here in Hawaii, wages are much much higher than they are in the mainland. But you know, even with a, you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in income, you still couldn't purchase a home in Hawaii. The, the average cost of a home in Hawaii is now north of a million dollars. Yeah. And so you know, the idea is to create a new revenue stream that goes along with the employment that makes it possible for people to obtain housing. Um, and so, you know, the numbers do work. We've we've done a couple of them now, uh, just mm-hmm. internally. And the idea is to take it and expand it and make it available to more families. It's really cool. Are you going to train them at all on the management side, teach them a little bit about how to be a host? Some of them maybe aren't coming from those backgrounds of being a host before, are you guys going to put them through a crash course or something? The the goal, there's so many people that, you know, with 7,000 families working in the industry here, there's so many people who have experience that are just looking for the access to the capital that, you know, certainly we can provide some guidance and and some best practices. Um, But, you know, capitalism works because people take risk and they, they innovate and they, they, um, you know, solve their own problems. So certainly we can provide some resources, but ultimately it's up to the family to, you know, be successful or not, you know, that people do fail. Um, yeah. And, and it's that risk and that uh, willingness to learn and that, that dynamic, you know, that dynamic uh, panic maybe might be a good word as, as somebody who's a, a multiple, you know, three or four time entrepreneur, that panic of not being able to make payroll in two months and oh boy, I got to innovate that, you know, that's what drives innovation. And in many cases, you know, leads people to success. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's kind of been our tagline for a long time is discomfort drives innovation because at the end of the day, if you're too comfortable, you're not innovating anything. So I do yep. I do love that and have a big appreciation for that philosophy yep. right there. Uh, uh, what is it? Um, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yeah. So if you, you know, I got, I got to make payroll in two months and I don't know how to do it. Like that's, that's where you sit down and you say, hey, you know, well, maybe we could, you know, add a, a component of, you know, here on our farm. Um, you know, we're looking at doing farm tours starting next August. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the idea is that that guests can come and park on the street. Um, that we would have a social media enabled gate, so you have to basically um, contact us or give us your contact information through social media to get on the property, which gives us a little bit of security. We kind of know who you are, but um, also gives us access so we can market to you in the future. And then mm-hmm. we have a nice walking tour where they can learn about all the coffee and how it's grown and how it's processed and maybe have a picnic on the property. 
and then a uh, vending machine on the way out so that they can buy coffee. And I, in an ideal world, they, they subscribe to the coffee um, and get a, a pound every month from that point on. And that becomes a part of our revenue stream. Um, you know, that's something that, that, that we're looking to stand up as one innovative way to continue to pay the bills in, in one of the most expensive markets in the United States. Yeah. And, you know, I'm kind of getting a similar. Okay. So when I, I went to Portugal about seven years ago and they have a similar, even though it's not as expensive to live there, property prices have gone crazy and the locals don't make a lot of money there. They make a very small salary. So they're kind of priced out because of all the expats moving there and tourism. Um, and I stayed at a house. It was a guest house one time and it was beautiful. It was this gorgeous, probably 10,000 square foot property they inherited from their family. And you can tell that they just couldn't afford it unless they, they rented it out. They had to rent it out or they couldn't hold this property. But you can you also got the vibe as a guest that they really didn't want you there. They had to have you there and they knew this. So it was a little bit of that, like they, they were begrudgingly renting it out to us, um, even though they wanted the house, they had to keep the house to do it. So my point with a story is, are you getting at that vibe at all? from any of the owners um, were, you know, in your, in your market that have been there for 20, 30, 40 years, maybe. And now it's becoming to the point where they have to start renting their property out and doing these innovative things, or they can't afford to keep it. Um, or is this more just like younger families that are starting out and don't really have much yet. And this is the only way they can afford to live. Uh, mostly it's younger families that are participating in newly hosted rentals. And that's one of the reasons that we're looking to protect those folks from, from regulation. You know, there's, there's a lot of grandfather clauses in here that take care of folks who've been doing this for 20 or 30 years, but it's the incoming family, the young family that wants to purchase a, whatever, a 3000 square foot house and, and use a thousand as a hosted rental and the other 2000 for the family those are the folks that are really in danger of not being able to participate in the market anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, almost universally across the board, the hosts that, that we interact with and the hosts that are member of our community love most of their guests. Now, at, from time to time, you always get a guest who's a little harder to deal with or a little bit more of a pain. But for the most part, you know, guests who come and stay at least at our farm are super polite, um, you know, they're just really excited to be here in Hawaii. You know, they want, they're, they're in awe of, you know, the ocean views and the weather and, the, you know, the beautiful coffee. And, you know, they're here to, to, to do the same thing. You know, they all want to go do the Monterey dive. They all want to go to the beach. They all want to go see the volcano. And, um, and for the most part, you know, people who are on vacation, you know, are pretty nice. And, and, you know, I would say that's especially true of people who are staying in vacation rentals. You know, the, the, the types of folks that are high demand and high maintenance and, you know, want to have their, 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 for lack of a better example, to have their nails and toes done in their hotel room. You know, those are the ones that are staying at the four seasons down at the beach. You know, it's the family with the, that just got off a six hour flight with a two screaming two-year-old that just wants some peace and quiet and, and want to enjoy a, a, a local setting. Those are the types of guests that the, at least we get up here at the farm. And, and certainly I know another, a bunch of the farm stays do. And then many of our members have stories of long-term friendships that they've built with their guests. You know, we, we had a family from Alaska come stay with us for two full months um, towards the end of COVID that just became really, really good friends. And, you know, they come back every year and visit and we love to have them. And, and those are the types of experiences I think that are typical here in Hawaii. Um, and then of course, from time to time, you get people who misbehave and and, you know, it, and that's true both of hosted and unhosted rentals. And, and I think that most of the regulation in the industry should be focused on identifying the folks who are misbehaving and the hosts that are not enforcing rules and making sure that, that we provide them with the support they need to, to enforce the rules and help the guests to understand and behave in our communities. And I think that if we focus on that, as opposed to, you know, regulating a grandma who's trying to, trying to rent a, a uh, an Ohana, a small second home. Uh, you know, I think that we could get a lot further in improving the, the, uh, the reputation of the industry. Yeah, that's great. Now we talked a lot about, um, we, we talked a lot about the people that have lived there, the locals, people that have grown up there, people that are, are living there currently doing this. What are your feelings towards investors that are 
cash flow driven people. They don't live there. They're absentee owners coming in, buying things up to try to make a profit. And, you know, capitalism is great and there's nothing wrong with that. But with this being such a problem already for locals, do you feel that the um, these investors coming in are maybe taking opportunities away from the locals that are already having a hard enough time dealing with the regulatory landscape? Or do you feel that that's healthy? I think that it doesn't matter whether it's hosted or unhosted. It matters how the guests behave. And so I think the, the issue with absentee STVR owners isn't necessarily that they're gobbling up real estate. Um, in fact, I, I think on all of the major islands, they've already regulated the absentee owners and there's a, a process in place to, to limit that impact on the, on the local housing market. Um, it really comes down to the behavior of the guests. And I, and I think that absentee owners really struggle to, you know, ident- you know, to create rules and to identify a local host that can help to manage the property and then to manage the behavior of the guests on the property. And, and that's really, I think, where the conflict with neighbors comes in. It's the parking and the noise and all of the things that are associated with poorly managed vacation rentals rather than whether it's owned by somebody in California or owned by somebody who's living on the, on the site. And, and I would argue that there are hosted rentals here, you know, that are are hosting, you know, reality TV series on the beach, you know, where they're getting ten and fifteen thousand dollars a night, but they're having wild parties and bright lights and loud music and you know camera crews and parking and like all these other issues. Those are hosted, you know. The host is there on site watching over the, all that chaos, and once again, that's creating impacts for the neighbors. So yeah. I don't think it really comes down to how the ownership structured. I think it more comes down to the behaviors. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing that, um, Joshua. One other thing, we talked a lot about everything else, but we didn't talk about you personally yet. So we have about a minute left. Why don't you tell us something about you as to like your why you're doing this, why you got into this and how you kind of found yourself where you are right now in this industry? Sure. So I I built the open source version of Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant, an open source voice assistant. And in 2018, we decided to go out and work to support a bunch of smaller languages. So things like Catalan and Hawaiian and Icelandic and Welsh. And as part of that, I lived in Airbnbs for an entire year. So we stayed in a different Airbnb for two weeks in cities all over the world, um, you know, for for an entire year, everywhere from Reykjavik to uh, Auckland. And as part of that process, I realized, you know, what a what a great thing it would be to have a, a hosted rental or have a vacation rental somewhere because you can rent it and travel anywhere in the world and take that rent and pay for a, a, a Airbnb wherever you happen to be. And so, you know, having identified that, we moved to Hawaii and uh, we bought a house and divided it in half. And, and we live upstairs and we have guests downstairs every night. And it's a fantastic way for us to afford to live on our farm. The, certainly the coffee doesn't pay the mortgage. Uh, and then also, you know, as our kids head out to college, you know, it's, it's a path for us to travel in the future. So we're, we're really excited to be part of the industry. And, and, you know, as responsible owners, you know, we manage our guests and make sure that we enforce the rules and, and are hoping for many decades to come of, of successful participation in the tourist industry. Wonderful. That's such a great story. I love Reykjavik, by the way. Great town um, or great city. Real quick, if we could just put the website up one more time for everybody to see before we hop off. There we go. If you want to connect with Joshua and you want to be a part of what he's doing, um, either with his fund or talk to him about becoming a property owner, um, you can visit the website. It's up on the the link is on the screen. Uh, Joshua, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. You were absolutely fascinating to interview and I wish you all the best with what you're doing. And I think it's a beautiful thing to give back to the community the way you are. So um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you in a couple more weeks on our next episode of Vacation Rentals or the Future. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.